Fantasy Bible Podcast, and I'm your host, Marcus Onate, and now we're bringing to you lessons from the Bible, from the tape archives of the Fellowship Bible Church in Joliet, Illinois. All lessons are taught by our pastor, the Reverend Chuck Rains, and so today we're going to be having, well, more lessons. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be from August the 6th, 2023. So this is one of the more recent ones. Most of the ones we've been doing in the past are from the 80s and 90s. This is from 2023. So I had a bunch of those. So I thought, well, why not put on some of the some of the later ones? And just as good as the earlier ones. So the name of this one is called God's Will for All, Universal Positives and Negatives in the Salvation. So that's like a pretty good uh, message. From what I heard of it, I'd be glad to bring that to you. So let's get right to it. And uh, remember to listen to the end because I got a few announcements at the end of this. But let's just go on, take it away, Pastor Rains. The Word of God can be understood, it's clear. It does have sections in it that we sometimes say, well, that's hard to understand. But sometimes the sections that we call hard to understand are hard to understand because they seem to say something different than another place is uh, uh, in the scripture that we understand it in a different way. So would you open with me to second, uh, I'm sorry, to first Timothy, first Timothy. Chapter 2, 1 Timothy, chapter 2. <clears throat> I'd like to begin at verse 1. Again, look at your scriptures, read them with me. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. When you read the scriptures, require the scriptures to speak to their fullest. In logic, there are words called universal positives and universal negatives. You must understand what those are. Universal positives are things like this, all. Universal negatives are things like this, none, not one. Universal positive, everyone. You see, they mean to include and then not exclude any, include all, and not exclude any. So God wants there to be prayer for all men. You cannot exclude any from that prayer list, even for the giving of thanks. You have to learn that even in maybe in the workings of a figure that seems to you be very, very hurtful and very despised, that you should be able to give thanks, maybe not for what they are or what they do, but maybe because God has protected you from them in some way, or maybe they haven't been able to do all that their evil thoughts would like to do or because God is using forces to limit them. There are good reasons to give thanks. But notice, it's for all men. Now that universal positive is a key idea to carry with you in this section. For kings and all who are in authority. That's sometimes hard for people when they say, well, I'm of this certain political party, or I'm of that, or I'm independent, 
or whatever. And they, they, they could never really envision themselves really praying for those who aren't in their party. If you're a Republican, you say, Lord, I want to pray for the Democrats today. And boy, do they need it. You know, that's what you <laughs> Amen, yeah. But it goes both ways. And God would say, for all that are in authority. And uh, why does he say this? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Now, when you read that, you might think that what you're praying for is um, that because of the operations of the government, maybe, and those others in authority, that you're praying that they would make laws and enforce the rule of law so that the evil intent of men, wherever they may be in, 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 in the society, that evil intent will not disrupt safe, peaceful, happy life that you know. Now, you may think that's what you're really praying about, and that's what God's intent is. Huh. But if we read on, let's read three. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Strong statement. This is what God wants. If I can, please, this is God's will that you pray this way. Oh, but uh, is it really just a peaceful society he wants us to pray about? Is that what this is all about? That we're praying for all men and for even those that uh, may uh, be causing trouble in society, even though they have the place of leadership. No, no, not so when you get to verse 4. God is a subject in verse 3, for it is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who, that's God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. In other words, the focus of God in all of this is not for us just to have a nice, peaceful place to live without war, maybe, or without all the uh, corruptions that people could bring into the society. That's not really the focus that God is giving to us. What his will is has to do with something far more important. His will has to do with eternal things. Whether somebody is saved or not, whether they have salvation or not. Because he desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what's guiding you to pray for all these people praying even for those in authority in the government, ultimately, that they might come to the place of being saved, that they might come to the place of seeing their need for Christ, to see their sin and God's love and God's provision of a Savior and turn to him. You say, I didn't get that in my first, my first reading. I thought it was all about just having a peaceful society. It's not about how your living conditions are. It's about the spiritual reality of eternity for those that you're praying for. Your purpose in prayer has an eternal pur purpose and a very large perspective. It's not all centered back on you and on your peaceable life, but on God's ultimate purpose for the, uh, the whole human race. 
that they all be saved. And then it reads in verse 5, and some would say, well, you've left the context. No, I haven't. For there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Remember when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No man. That's a universal negative. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You cannot enter eternity and dwell with God without Jesus as your Savior. Doing good. Having good purpose in your worship, though you're worshiping a tree or a Buddha or a snake. Not good enough. You don't come to the place of receiving Christ as your Savior. Committing yourself into God's hands, trusting whatever provision he has made. And that's where the people in the Old Testament were, you know. They didn't have all that we have in the New Testament. What they had to do was cast themselves upon the Lord, believing what he had given to them, trusting in him, whatever provision he was making. They had to do that when they were offering up animal sacrifices. It's not because they fully understood the meaning of the animal sacrifice. I'm sure that, well, I'll be very conservative. I'm sure that most of them didn't know that. I, I Personally, I don't think very many at all ever knew that. That the animal sacrifice was really looking forward to a one-time sacrifice of a human being that had come into the human race by the incarnation through the divine conception by the Holy Spirit so as to live a perfect life and offer that life up as a single sacrifice for sin. That, I don't believe, was fully understood in the Old Testament. But this they could do. They could trust God. They could cast themselves on him. They could utterly and absolutely put their life under his control, yield it to him, love him, worship him, make him their all in all, their whole supply, their whole dependence, their whole entirety of, of meaning and purpose. That they could do. And that they did many times. Those that we'll see in glory did that. Why? Because God would put to their account what he was going to provide in Christ, and they were benefited that blessedness of the cross because they fully trusted whatever it was that God was going to provide without knowing the details. And whatever it was was the cross. It's God's will that all men should be saved. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The only way to the Lord through him. Who gave himself a ransom for all. Universal positive. Jesus did not die for some. That's a terrible, blasphemous teaching. He died for all. Gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You see, man is living in time and space. All of the provisions that God was going to make and of a Savior had to await a certain point in time. It had to happen in time. And it did, when the time was fully come, according to the scripture, Galatians. Christ did come forward, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. And really, to redeem all mankind. He gave himself 
a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And the time uh, of the ultimate declaration of all this is going to happen when? When God calls forth all who are alive and all who are dead, and ultimately they're brought before him as their judge, if they have taken him as their savior, they will be in his presence forever. If they have not received him as their savior, they will be judged. It will be testified. It will be declared for eternity that they are condemned. Now, seeing God's main concern for the salvation of mankind, what we need to see in this section. You see, we are really looking at God's will. And the salvation of mankind is for our blessing in eternity. And being saved, God wants us to live in a way that honors him, our lives show forth his nature of primarily righteousness and love in this world. So we have to understand this. What God would like to see happen is not the controlling factor in whether a person will be saved. Let me say that again. What God would like to see happen is not the controlling factor in whether a person is saved or not. See, some teach that the will of God is absolute to the point that if something is his will, it will come to pass. But the scripture doesn't tell us that. He actually desires some things that do not come to pass. He actually wills some things that do not come to pass. You see, it is God's will that man should live in accordance with his word. He should live in righteousness. He should live in love. He showed us this when he set out rules for man to live by back there when he created man. There was a time when man was righteous, when he was first created. He had unbroken fellowship with God day by day. He was not under the sentence of death at that time. Not as he was first created. And God made his will known to man when he told him not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was his will. And he declared it to man. But God's will, hear me now, God's will did not prevail. And you have to deal with that. God willed that man should need of that, but that isn't what happened. Why? Well, he had ma made man in a way after his own image in this sense that man was given a will. By that, it meant that man could exercise his will in agreement with God or in disagreement with God, contrary to the will of God. Now, whether you want to call that freedom of will or not, he had the power to exercise his will contrary to God. And he did. That's what the scriptures clearly teach. Man did. <laughs> but 
Man had the power to choose to violate the will of God. And when he, God gave him the power to choose whether he would agree with the will of God or violate the will of God, also something came with that. And that's the responsibility for the consequences. You see, it was God's will for man to always choose righteousness, to obey his word, to always be holy. That was the will of God. So we see that God could have a will for man which would not come to pass. We are clearly taught that if man chose against God, to, uh, chose to go against God's will, that was not what God wanted. So, come back to verse 4 here. Who desires all men to be saved. It's God's will for all men to be saved. That does not mean it will come to pass. We should never teach that God would do anything that would make it impossible for even one person to be saved. I'll say it again. You cannot ever accept a teaching that says God would do something to keep somebody from being saved. to block them from being saved, to prevent them from being saved. And you want to do that actively or inactively, you could say, well, he wouldn't do something or he wouldn't fail to do something necessary for them to be saved. He wouldn't do something to block them from being saved. Why? Because he desires all men to be saved. So you cannot ever have a doctrine or teaching that God would do something to prevent somebody from being saved. I'm going a step at a time with you. He'd be working against the clear statement of his desire or his will if he did that. Because in verse 6 here, Christ gave himself a ransom for all. For all. Go with me to 2 Peter 3 9. This is a follow up verse. You probably know this verse. Let me read it. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish. Now, if you want it in the negative, it's, it's not willing that any should perish. But I'm thankful that he actually adds this on the positive. But that all should come to repentance. He's not willing that any should perish. Now, perish there speaks of eternal judgment. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not. What? Should not what? Perish. Perish is eternal hell. Separation from God, eternal darkness. He's not willing that any should perish. God's will is this. He does not will that any should go to hell. Takes no delight in anybody going to hell. He didn't he would never do one thing that would make somebody go to hell. He wouldn't do one thing that would block them from being saved. 
because he's not willing that any should perish. But on the other hand, that all should come to repentance. You see, you come to the Lord Jesus, you come to God, you come to salvation by the way of repentance. Repentance is not a separate thing from belief in Christ. It's actually a part of belief in Christ. You're going to come to Jesus. You're going to come because you need a Savior, because you see you're a sinner, because you see your need. And you see the terribleness of that need and the awful consequences that you deserve. And you have to turn away from that. You have to reject those awful consequences. You have to see them as bad and say, I don't want those. I, I reject that I should go that way. Repentance means you have a change of your mind. An utter reversal, 180 degree turn. That 180 degree turn is putting your faith in Jesus. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, go with me to Titus now. Timothy Titus. Chapter 3. Uh, why am I missing it? Well, I'm going to pass it by because I was going to show you uh, that the grace of God has appeared to all men. It's 2.11. Yeah, I didn't, it's not 3, it's 2. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. You see how the word grace is brought in that into that? The grace of God brings salvation. Why did God bring his son to this earth? Why did he provide a savior through the terrible suffering that Christ had to endure? Why did the Son of God have to willingly give himself, having lived a righteous life? Well, it all has to do with grace. And yet John 3.16 tells you, really, God so loved the world that he did this, so you are forced to understand this. Grace is the outworking of love. Love sent the Lord Jesus. It was grace working through what God provided in Jesus. Meaning, you didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. You can't earn it. It's a free gift. And love provides it. Grace has been, it says, here in verse 11, it has appeared to all men. He didn't just come for some. He came for all. It's a wide open truth that God made known in Christ. Go to Second Corinthians five with me. Second Corinthians five. Again, pretty 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 well known section here, but let's bring it into context with what we have. 
Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God. Now, all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Not that, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world, all men, reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we're ambassadors for Christ as though God was pleading through us. We implore you in, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Well, in other words, it says, <laughs> when he reconciled the world to himself, what that amounted to was that in Christ, listen, through Jesus, somebody that would be before God or come before God in Christ, would not be an enemy. He would not be under judgment. He would be at peace with God. He would have fellowship with God. He would be joined in sweetness of relationship to God. He would be reconciled. And not imputing their trespasses to them means not putting their sins to their account. That's what you have in Christ. That was what was provided for the whole world. Jesus died so that everybody could be reconciled to God and not have their sins put to their account. But you see, while that's provided, he sends us out there as ambassadors, crying out to people, be reconciled to God. In other words, calling on them to make a decision. Calling on them to act according to the will that God has given every man to choose what God has provided. To choose Christ. To be reconciled to God. In other words, by taking Christ, they would be brought into a relationship with God. By taking Christ, their sin is not put to their account. That's the ministry of reconciliation. We're calling on people to make that choice to receive Christ. It's available to all. He did it for the whole world. Anybody can be saved. Anybody. So long as they are still alive. So there's a postponed judgment. They're not going to be called into account for their trespasses until they die without Christ. Until then, we can Cry to them, be reconciled. That's a plea. And he sends us out there to make that plea to the world. But only if they accept Christ will they have the righteousness of God. It's provided. Now I'm going to do something at the last here. I'm going to jump to it very quickly. Once you have established the clear teaching of the Word of God on a subject, and you come to another section that you might read, and you think, well, if I, I read this, there's some confusion now. 
I'm not sure what the scriptures mean. I'm going to give you an example. John, Gospel. Let's go to chapter 6. Here we are in John chapter 6, verse 37. Now you're going to read this. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Now you could read that this way. The Father's going to decide which ones are going to come to Jesus. And uh, those are the ones he's going to give to Jesus. Because the Father gives me, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And therefore, the Father is deciding who's going to come to Jesus. And so you say, well, I don't, I don't really understand that verse. That, that bothers me. Listen. The Bible is like no other book in the world. It's from God. If you accept that, you understand this very basic principle. It does not contradict. There's nothing in it that's going to say something contrary to some other part of it. If it makes a statement, that statement is going to be true. Jesus is the truth. There's no lie, and God cannot lie, the scripture says. You cannot read this verse in such a way as to make it contradict what you know to be true, that it's the will of God that all men should be saved. He doesn't desire anybody to come into judgment. That he has revealed his will. He's not going to do something that will actually prevent that from happening. You cannot charge God with doing something in deciding who to give to Jesus so as to make it impossible for somebody that he doesn't do that for to go to hell. Make them, make them go to hell. You can't read this verse that way, and you must not. You have your controlling verses. You've got your controlling truth about the will of God. You create problems for yourself trying to read a verse in such a way that it contradicts other scripture that is very, very clear. That's why I began with scripture that cannot, it's stated in universal positive and universal negative terms. That's the most ironclad, basic form and position in logic that you can have. You start there. And you come to these kind of sections, you say, well, I've got to understand that in some way, but I'm not going to contradict what it says in the scripture. Now, there are those with philosophies, those with theologies that go to these verses and use the meanings that they can get out of these verses as the basis for truth. Of course, they don't know what to do with the verses that have the universal positives or negatives. They kind of just pass those off. Let me just give you another place and I'll be done. How about uh, chapter, stay in John, chapter 13, verse 18. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. 
So you have some that would say, well, you know, Christ did some choosing, and uh, Judas wasn't one of them, and so he's going to go to hell because he wasn't chosen. Chapter 15, verse 16. A little while, and you'll see me. You, you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Because I go to the Father, well, I'm, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, that's too, uh, I'm going to skip that and say, I don't want to raise up difficulties for you. Listen to some familiar verse in Romans 8. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called. Whom he called, those he also justified. And whom he justified, those he also glorified. And boy, it all starts back there with his predestination. And then on the basis of his predestination, he calls, and these people get justified. And so you say, well, then maybe he didn't call them all. No, because not all are going to be justified. And so you're going to end up with a teaching that's saying, God is responsible for who goes to heaven because he's going to call some and not others. Now you say... Would any responsible student of the scriptures go down that road? And I want to tell you something. There is a whole branch of thinking, a whole branch of theology, a whole branch of interpretation of the scriptures that has gone down that road. That branch of teaching used to be small. But it now infects almost every Bible college and seminary in the world. And every denomination. Has some. And they're increasing in number. There are wonderful schools that used to be so true to the Word of God that have taken up this teaching. I personally had to disassociate from being one uh, to teach it one that used to be so so solid in the Word of God. But now they teach. God predestines who's going to be saved. And then God calls certain ones, doesn't call others. And then he justifies those people and they go to heaven. Because God knows how to say it. God is sovereign. Well, your view of sovereignty violates the fact that he wills that all men should be saved. It violates the declared will of God. That none should perish. You can't have it both ways, people. You have to let the clear statements of Scripture underlie whatever whatever interpretation you give to any section. One thing you're going to find out about this word predestination. It is not predestination unto salvation. It's very clearly here. I'll just explain this. Look at verse 29. 
just to help you with the one word, predestination. What does it have to do with? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Let me tell you what that means. If you decide to receive Jesus as your Savior, <laughs> God has made a determination already. It's settled in heaven and glory forever. If you decide to receive Jesus as your Savior, you are going to be conformed to the image of his Son. It's predestined by God. If you receive Jesus, that's what you're going to get. You say, well, I, that's, I, I, I like that. I, I, I'm in favor of that. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I, I want to be conformed to the image of his son. Well, that's what predestination is all about. That is the wonderful, gracious, loving act of God that says that if anybody would receive his son, he is going to conform them to the image of his son. They're going to be like Jesus before him. They're going to be at complete peace with him. They're going to be in the family. They're going to be loved without any barrier or any obstacle. There'll be no sin in them. And you say, wow. What a blessed truth from a word that some use to destroy the will of God that all should be saved. I thank God he's predestined me to be conformed to the man but Jesus. I sure don't want to be in heaven and not be conformed to the image of his son. And here's the happy news. I'm not going to be in heaven without being conformed to the image of his son. It's settled. God's predetermined it. It's settled. What isn't settled is whether somebody receives Jesus and and God has not interfered into that to make the choice. So stick with the word of God in its clear statements and let those be your foundation for coming to the words or the scriptures or the places where you see some questionable understanding, some questionable interpretation. Father, thank you for your word and its clarity and teaching. We thank you for your love for us to provide the Savior. I thank you, Lord, that you want all men to be saved and that you have looked to us and given us the responsibility to cry out to this world that they need to be reconciled. Help us, Lord, be good ambassadors in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rains. That was a great message, right? Didn't I tell you? Yeah, you should listen to me. You know, when I say it's a great message, it's a great message. <laughs> okay, so I was going to give a few announcements here at the end. Um, we've been putting transcripts up on the, the website, so if you haven't checked that out, uh, it should be up to episode 40. From 37 to 40, I think we have up there. And then, uh, so we're caught up, and then as we go along, we'll be putting up some of the back episodes. But but the transcripts are really well done. My sister has been editing them, and they're a really nice document. You can go there and read them, or you can uh, download them. And they're really nice and readable, and it's good to, to use in your Bible study. And also, we have cards. We have uh, postcards. If you would like one, just send us your uh, your name and address in the uh, in the comment section of the website, and uh, we'll send those out. If you want a few of them, you could put down. Give me a few. We'll you could give those out uh, in your church or your friends or whoever you want. We got plenty of them, so we, we want to get rid of them. So make sure you go to the website. The website is www legacybiblepodcast.com so check it out it's an ongoing project I'm constantly trying to uh, improve it 
So I'm trying to get more and more stuff up there to make it more than just a, a place you can listen to the podcast, which you can. I mean, you can listen to the podcast. I'm going to be putting the the um, the YouTube channel, so you could listen to it on the YouTube channel there. I mean, it's the same as the audio podcast, but I'll put links on there to, for subscribing to the various platforms it's on. I'll be doing that. Like I said, there's going to be the transcripts on there. So you can go there and read them or download them. And I don't know. They might be able to put a few more things up there if I could think of it. But it's an ongoing thing. It's going to keep on improving. So keep going back to the website. Because there's going to be more and more information up there. All right, then. So thanks for listening. Come back again next week because we'll have more for you from the tape archives of the Fellowship Bible Church. So come on back, bring your friends, share it with your friends, your family. And I've noticed a huge increase in uh, listening for October, which is good. It means somebody's uh, sharing the podcast somewhere. And I'm really surprised it's going around the world. So thank you, listeners, for listening and, and sharing. But don't stop. Keep sharing. All right. So thank you for listening. I'll see you again next week. And until then, have yourself a great week and have yourself a great day. See you next time.